How's it going everyone? My name is Unfar, and this is Underdog Run for Pokemon Legends Arceus. You might know about special playthroughs of Pokemon games like Nuzlocking or Single Tie Playthroughs, which are special self-imposed rule sets designed to provide a more challenging experience to these games. And in that spirit, I have invented my own rule set for this playthrough, which I will be sharing on screen as well as in the description, and provide more specifics as we go. And with that out of the way, let us begin. My journey begins with Arceus asking what I look like and what name I go by. For this playthrough, I decided to go with Dawn and the name Agent West. Following this, apparently Arceus abducts me from my bed long enough to upgrade my iPhone to the Arceus model and gives me one mission, to seek out all Pokémon, before sending me on the adventure of a lifetime. After passing out again, I awake to the frantic shouting of, Pokémon? After playing 20 questions with Professor Laventon, he decides to help me with my current situation when his Pokemon decide to take off for exploring parts unknown with the Professor having to leave me to keep up with them. A short distance away, I manage to find my Arc phone on the ground, and after a closer look, I find the message Arceus left for me saying, Seek out all Pokemon, as though I needed a reminder not 10 minutes having arrived. I then continue my quest to seek out Professor Laventon, who wasn't too hard to find, and asks me if I can help him catch his three runaways, which I proceed to do with easily catching Oshawott, shortly followed with catching Rowlet, with only having Cyndaquil give me trouble since he was the last of the trio to catch. After complimenting my bravery and skill at catching Pokemon, since his aim is worse than the average ten-year-old, I then for some reason share the message from Arceus on my phone with the professor who then tells me of his dream to compile his Sui's first Pokedex and proposes we team up to reach our goals which I agree to, without telling him my dream is not to catch them all, but to conquer the champion of his Sui. We arrive at the gates of Jubilife Village where the professor gives his compliments to the guard for his diligent work before vouching for me. We enter the village where the locals stare at me with suspicion and talk about me as we pass by. The professor then informs me he has to go on ahead to Galaxy Headquarters to report the events that have transpired and asks me to wait for him at the Wallflower before running off. I then for some reason receive a GPS upgrade to my Arc phone presumably from Arceus before heading to the Wallflower, where the tavern keeper Benny refuses to wait on me since I'm a stranger. Real cold, man. Shortly followed by my future rival and friend Rai belittle my flimsy excuse for clothes for not likely providing any protection from Pokemon attacks and deduces that the professor must have vouched for me to even be in Jubilife Village. After a short exchange between the professor and Rai about my being nominated as a Galaxy Team Survey Corps member, I get to meet Captain Silene, who the professor had convinced to give me a trial to prove my worth as a 15-year-old Pokemon protege. Captain Silene then proceeds inside the Wallflower while the three of us have our potato mochi outside. Karma, Benny, karma. And a conversation about my exploits, including falling from the sky. I'm telling you, I'm not from Team Sky. Shout out to m and TV. After finishing supper, I'm shown where my place to sleep is, and after a few good nights, I proceed to my bed, deciding to turn in having had enough surprises for one day. Well, that just happened. I wake to the sound of Brian knocking on my door, wanting me to come out to play- I mean, to talk about my upcoming trial that I must pass or risk being expelled from the village, possibly to my death. Yeah, that's been brought up a few times. By order of Captain Silene, we enter her office to receive the specifics of my trial, which are to catch Shinx, Starly, and Bidoof, which Rai shows surprise to the scale of the task, not knowing that when I come from, catching three is just a warm-up for building an entire team. After receiving my reverse money belt and some fashion advice, I'm ready to head out when the professor asked me to join him in the main hall to choose my starter for protection in the wild. I go with Cyndaquil, even though I won't be using him on my team for long, since I will be using what I'm going to call the starter clause, which allows me to swap the starter for whomever I intend to add to my team immediately after the catching tutorial. I head outside to make my way to the Obsidian Fieldlands when I run into the man, the myth, the legendary art, Nah, it's just Volo, who decides to give me a lesson in battling 101 using his Togepi as a punching bag. After a few quick attacks from my Cyndaquil, sending his little egg to the Pokemon Center, he then heals up my team and we proceed to the Fieldlands, and after a short preview of the cinematography for Breath of the Pokemon, 
Rai decides to handhold my entire efforts at catching the trio of wild Pokemon needed to pass my trial for the Survey Corps, and decide to add Shinx as my first catch from the Obsidian Fieldlands. Welcome to the team, Dexter. After catching Rai's arch nemesis, he tells me I caught them all and now believes what Professor Lamington said about me. We head back to the base camp to tell the professor of my passing the trial, to which he decides to commemorate the occasion with a picture. Professor! After volunteering to be the cover for the professor's human entry, we return to Jubilee Village to report my success to Captain Silene. Yep, and I am pretend to have ten, Ray. Though, of course, not all of them in my party at once, but that's going to be my whole team. Uh, before we go reporting, let's actually get rid of everyone who's not going to be a part of my team members. Oh, I can't do it yet? Brr. As a reward for my efforts, Captain Silene furnishes me with my own Galaxy Team uniform. Oh, goody, my own uniform. And issues my next set of orders, which are to appear before the commander in uniform. I look so cool. I'm still gonna change this first chance I get for something hopefully better. After a quick change, Captain Silene decides to add the finishing touch to my new look before sending me to the commander, who couldn't care less about my appearance and decides to share with me his interest in wrestling by ordering me to attack him. Uh, what, sir? I'm just a kid, sir. Why do this, sir? Well, you asked for it, sir. Ah! Oh. Following that <clears throat> close draw, the commander tells me that the people of Jubilife will be slow to trust an outsider like me, and recommends that I work hard as a member of the Galaxy team to complete the Pokedex, and warns me to beware of the danger Pokemon pose. Soon following that unique first meeting, I am given the rank of Galaxy Grunt and receive my first requisition of materials and some pocket change. Gee, thanks, boss. Our generous captain then instructs Rai to teach me about the fundamentals of crafting, which Rai agrees to and will be eagerly waiting for me outside. Upon exiting headquarters, I am greeted by Antha, the local clothier who the professor asks to provide me with a spare change of clothes. Thanks, professor. Hmm, the local clothier. Ooh, new drip. I'll be checking it out soon enough. Thank you, Antha. Rai tries to get me to focus on the task at hand by flagging me down. Yeah, I'm coming, Ray. Hold on. Oh, but never mind. I make some Pokeballs, and the professor then provides me with my own paperback Pokedex to record my observations. Catch him, catch him, gotta catch him. He then tells me he'll be waiting for me at the Fieldlands camp. Yes, that was one. Me and Dexter. After sharing my destination with the gatekeeper, I reach the campsite where Rye believes it's vital for me to learn the way of the High Rollers, which I couldn't agree more. Drop off all non-team members. I'm finally able to freely explore the field lands, but Rai being Rai decides to help my efforts by giving me tips on how to complete my Pokedex research. I then set out to catch my second teammate, which makes for a good time to explain another rule I have yet to mention, which is that for every Pokemon I add to my team, only the first I catch will be valid. Let's see how that went. Okay, go away. There should be more. But the question is... Which one shall be my next teammate? There they are. Oh, Lord. Yes. Okay, boss, go! I choose you. Really? Please get in the ball. Please get in the ball. Please get in the ball. Oh, come on. Another one. 
quietly he sneaks towards his next friend, his next partner. He ready's the ball. He takes his aim. He shoots. Oh, but his partner wonders what that noise was, only to be shot in the back. Yes, we got our new friend. After finally catching a level 14 Abra instead of a level 12, I name it Normie and start my grind on completing Starly's entry and tried to complete Eevee's entry, which didn't go as well. After failing to find another Eevee, I decided to settle for Wurmple's entry, which took me way longer than it normally does. Almost like I wasn't meant to beat this run. After finally getting enough research points, I returned to Jubilife to show off Dexter Alright, Dexter, showtime! And have a change of wardrobe before reporting to Silene to earn my promotion from Galaxy Grunt to recruit. I then spend a lovely evening hanging out with Rai and the Professor after a long, long day who want to talk about work, and I get my first bit of information about a group of people calling themselves the Diamond Clan. The next morning, I get my first major setback when Rai challenges me to a battle with his Pikachu and shows how important it is to have the right team for each story battle, especially the first and last ones. Oh, I hope I don't need them. No one but Dexter for you. Here we go. Cat versus Mouse. You might be wondering why I'm not using Abra for this story battle against Rai, which is because my rule set doesn't allow me to use more Pokemon than the opposing trainers, and this is the first story battle where I use a modified level cap where my team's level is decreased by one before the first story battle for each new region, with the last one being a total of six levels below the post-game battles, including Volo. I don't call it underdog run for nothing. And well, that's a loss. Looks like I can't have my buddy Normie for the first region. I'm gonna have to wait until the Alabaster Icelands, I suppose. No, it's not amazing. I have to start all over again. Thank you, Ray. And you too, Pikachu. After learning my kitten has no chance against Rai's electric mouse, I ask Arceus for a second chance, and after being sent back to Hisui, it doesn't take me long to get back to the starter selection, where this time I go with Rowlet, but still choose to use the starter clause. I clobber Volo's egg, catch the wild trio, and decide to keep Shinx on the team, who is now called Denise, and have a rematch with Commander Kamado, before finally making my way back to the Obsidian Fieldlands to earn my next promotion to recruit, by redeeming my failed research on Eevee. Stay in the ball, stay in the ball. Now to catch your partner, who seems to be more elusive. Get in that ball. Yes! This time to make up for the two I missed. This time, I go with Ponyta as my second teammate and name him Flash Hoof. After grinding my team up and earning enough research points to earn a rematch with Rai, I accept his challenge and go with Flash Hoof as my battle partner. After taking a Thunder Wave followed by a Thunder Shock, Flash Hoof manages to fight through his paralysis and lands an Ember, taking out Pikachu. And that's how it's done. Oh, don't be too hard on him, Pikachu. You tried. But this time, I better I brought a better matchup. I then get to meet the unsung hero of these types of runs, Captain Zaisu of the Security Corps, who teaches me about strong style and agile style attacks. But what I find most useful is the series of moves she is able to teach my Pokemon that are normally that they normally wouldn't be able to learn. After swapping teammates, I return to the field lands to fulfill the request Rai received from a member of the Diamond Clan where Volo decides to play a prank on me, trying to pass it off as teaching me a stealth technique. After accepting a few side requests, I make my way to the bridge where I find Rai talking with a member of the Diamond Clan named Mei, who challenges me to a battle with her friend Munchlax to determine if I am worthy for a request she has, to which I choose Denise as my battle partner. I have Denise set up with baby doll eyes to minimize the damage caused by Munchlax's tackle attacks, followed up by a series of fire fangs to which we luck out getting the burn, further weakening Munchlax's attacks, before finishing it off with a guaranteed quick attack. We just managed to squeak by the win. 
After passing the test, Mei tells me the legend of an almighty Pokemon called Arc uh, Sinnoh, who blessed the Pokemon of a hero of old to which Mei is the warden to one of their descendants, before heading to Deer Track Heights where the mission is. After some grinding and Pokemon research, I make my way up to Deer Track Heights where I find the mission is an Alpha Cricketoon making a nuisance of itself to which I'm tasked with driving it off. For this battle, I go with Denise and Flamehoof. Since Alpha battles are harder than normal battles, I'm allowing myself to have a max team of two. I choose you, Flash Hoof. After getting hit with Aerial Ace, Flash Hoof softens its target with Ember before falling to another Aerial Ace, to which Denise comes in for a revenge kill with Fire Fang landing us the win. After besting the bothersome bug for Warden May, we are visited by her noble Weirdeer, who might have watched our triumph, before leaving us to discuss turning its noble seat into the location for a new base camp. After pitching the tents, raising the banners, and lighting the campfire, we return to Jubilife to celebrate with Potato Mochi and discuss the grievances caused by another noble Pokemon called Cleavor, who seems to be in a state of frenzy. Following the next day, it seems Rai has been sent to tell me to report to the commander's office for some unknown reason. After heading outside to meet up with Rai, our morning is spoiled by a bantering match between the leaders of the Diamond and Pearl clans, Adamon and Irida respectively, over whether Almighty Sinnoh is the ruler of time or space, and which clan is its faithful followers with believing the other clan to be following a fate, leaving me with the suspicion they're the reason I'm being summoned to the commander's office shortly following with Rai telling me we should get going. I decide to take a short shopping break before barreling to the commander's office hoping I didn't keep Commander Kamado waiting too long, who seems to be in a meeting with Adamon and Irida to discuss the trouble being caused by the Pearl Clan's noble Pokemon Cleavor, where Adamon is demanding something be done to put this crisis to an end and seems to be getting nowhere. I then enter the meeting where Adamon seems pleased to meet me, while Irida seems doubtful of the story she's heard about me. The commander then suggests sending me to figure out a way to solve the problem, where Adamon is immediately on board with the idea, Irida requires convincing to let a Pokeball-toting galaxy grunt like me to be assigned to such a mission, but goes along with it anyway. The commander then reminds me of the hesitation people might have to trust a stranger from the sky. If I said it once, I said it a dozen times. I wasn't sent by Team Sky. Meeting adjourned. After a lecture on behavior, I then receive my briefing from Captain Silene about my upcoming mission alongside Ray and Professor Lavington when Adamon and May interrupt our briefing with a speech about my coming from Almighty Sinnoh from the sky. Watch it, Adamon, and ask me on behalf of his clan to quell not only Cleavor, but all frenzied nobles, with Cleavor being the test case. May then tells me where I can find Cleavor and a few details about its warden Leon before departing. Briefing adjourned. Outside, I have a conversation with Volo where he gives me three super potions before leaving to explore some ancient ruins. I then head to the Grand Tree Arena where I meet the Warden for the Lord of the Woods, Leon, who assumes I'm an admirer here to see his charge Cleavor, but tries to turn me away saying it's too dangerous right now and even threatens to sick his goomy on me, to which I challenge him to a battle being two levels below the level cap. I choose you, Denise. I had Flash Hoof in my party to gain the XP reward, but to avoid breaking my rule about matching my opponent's team size, if Denise is defeated I will have to let Flash Hoof faint to restart the battle. Luckily that wasn't necessary since Denise was able to outlast Gumi's two bubble and acid attacks to seal the win using quick attack and bite. After that, Leon still refuses to let me see Cleavor explaining that even he is unable to calm Cleavor from its current state, to which Irida arrives to lecture him about his believing Cleavor being struck by lightning was a gift from Almighty Sinnoh, and his despairing to the point where they needed to rely on people outside the clan for help for everyone's sake, to which he asks if I actually could help them, to which I answer that I'll figure something out while he and Irida continue to try to calm Cleavor down. I then take my underleveling seriously and grind out a few more Pokedex entries before joining the professor in his lab, to where after being appraised of the situation and taking a long, long time to think about it, he comes up with the idea of throwing food at Cleavor. Professor, you're weird, but I'll do it. Heading outside, I notice May waiting for me and decide to make her wait longer by going on a bidu fund inside the village. You're welcome, ma'am. Anytime. Oh, hey, May, when did you get there? 
After a very short conversation, we head to Deertrek Heights Camp where Adaman has convinced Weirdeer to aid me in my quest of quelling Cleavor by serving as my pet mount and gifts me his deer flute with a few music lessons as well as the mind plate from Weirdeer. I then finish my Pokedex grinding before heading back to Grand Tree to prove to Irida my bonds with my Pokemon are not lessened by Pokeballs by beating her sister Glaceon. Go flash you. I have Flash Hoof start off with Flame Wheel before Glaceon responds with quick and swift attacks, but Flash Hoof manages to hang in there and finish Glaceon with another Flame Wheel. Another photo finish. After enlightening Irido with that battle, I proceed to explain the Professor's plan to quell Cleavor's frenzy. After we make the food bombs, I annoy Leon by delaying the battle. Keep your shirt, Keep your shirt on, Leon. I'm going to be improving the strength of my Pokemon before I send them out into battle. I have Denise evolve into Luxio and change her moveset, and I'm ready to throw down with the Lord of the Woods. It's that time again to explain the rules for noble battles, which is that I haven't set a limit for the team size against bosses, which you must defeat at least once before quelling or restart the fight. And also between actual battling, I'm allowed to use revives and potions since I'm not using the hardcore version of my challenge. Great work, team. Now it's reeling. Take him down! After besting the best bug of the field lands, Cleavor gives me the insect plate before evading the presence of Irida and his warden Leon. We then have a conversation about the light that escaped Cleavor's body, to which Leon believes was a blessing from Almighty Sinnoh, but Irida reasons that the lightning that had empowered Cleavor couldn't be from Sinnoh because of the harm it caused Cleavor to inflict on others, and says what I did had to be done. I head straight to Jubilife, where Volo appears to be waiting for me, having seen the light show of my battle with the noble Cleavor, and takes notice of the plates I was given by Weirdeer and Cleavor, and asks to see one, to which he shares his theories and his passion for archaeology before leaving. I then report my progress to Captain Silene for a promotion from recruit to a fully-fledged member of the Galaxy team. I then report to Commander Commodo, who congratulates my efforts in spite of reminding me that I'm a stranger, and tells me he's getting reports of more nobles being in a frenzied state before dismissing me to spend some time with Rai and the Professor at the Wallflower, to which I'm the topic of conversation for having bested Cleavor. Rai then shares with me a recipe he learned from Benny on how to make smoke bombs. After finishing our mochi, I'm on my way home when I'm approached by a little girl needing my help to save Asui from a danger that apparently I'm the only one willing to help with. I receive the keystone giving me super sight, and after grabbing a spirit, I go to bed. The next morning, I meet a Rezu, warden of the Diamond Clan, and haircutting master, who remembers her trip was to talk to the commander, to which I soon arrive to listen in on what she has to say. Which is that the Pearl Clan's Pokemon Ursaluna has become frenzied, and its warden Kalaba won't even give her the time of day to tell her, so she turns to the Galaxy team for help, to which I'm assigned a mission and given my briefing from Captain Silene to head for the Silesian ruins in the Crimson Mirelands to talk to Warden Kalaba. Outside, I take Antha's request before going to face my rival with my level cap dropping two levels below that of my rival's Pokemon, and just using Denise since I overleveled Flashu from the experience I gained from battling Cleavor. But our Ash Ketchum luck kicks in with Mind Junior going for Iron Defense, to which we use Fire Fang, followed with Mind Junior missing a Hypnosis before falling to a Quick Attack. Pikachu comes in, and we take advantage of being able to move first by setting up Baby Doll Eyes, expecting Pikachu to cause serious damage. After landing a Fire Fang, Pikachu fires back with another Agile and regular Quick Attacks, which Denise eats, and we seal the deal with a strong Quick Attack, showing Rai the bond I share with my team. Hey, just because I beat you with one Pokemon? Alright. We then head for the Crimson Mirelands, where the Professor explains space-time distortions. I then make my way to the Great Jaw Bog to catch my next teammate, Cherubi. Oh, Pokeball! Um, yes! I caught Cherubi! And name her Chansey. After earning enough money from my Pokedex grinding, I head back to Jubilife to check the moves my team can learn from Captain Zaisu, expand my pocket size, and finally change my dress code for the rest of the Mirelands. I make my way to our... <clears throat> As I was saying, I make my way to Celestion Ruins where I meet Elder uh, Warden Kalaba of the Pearl Clan and Warden to the Frenzied Ursaluna that Arezu told us about who deduces who I am from my Celeste a deer flute, but is cold to what I did to Cleavor, viewing it as nothing more than bullying, and disapproves of my using Pokeballs, before saying she doesn't need help from outsiders, then saying she's busy and for me to go away. Volo then suddenly comes in wanting a battle with me, to which I accept. For this battle, I go with Denise and Flash Hoop. I know Chansey would be a better type matchup, but she was caught too high a level for this battle. I choose you. 
I have Flashu fleet off with Flame Wheel, to which Togepi responds with a tackle. And not wanting to risk it surviving an Ember attack, we finish it off with another Flame Wheel, to which Rolo sends Gibble in for a revenge kill using Bulldoze. I then send out Denise for some revenge of our own with a single Ice Fang netting us the win. After the battle, Volo heals my team and reveals the reason he challenged me was to see if I was strong enough to help Warden Kalava to retrieve a wall fragment that was stolen by bandits. Volo then tells me where he found the remains of a campfire and says he will help me out if I find the bandits. After leveling Flash Hoof for the fight, I head to the campsite where I'm ambushed by the Proto Team Rocket Trio, the Misfortune Sisters, Charm, Clover, and Coin, to which Coin challenges me. Go Flash Hoof! I went with Flash Hoof, hoping our speed and use of hypnosis would land us an easy win. It didn't. On the attempt that we did succeed, we land the Hypnosis, with Toxicroak being too drowsy for its first turn, and we land a Flame Wheel, to which Toxicroak tries to fight back with Venoshock, but it's not enough, and we finish it off with another Flame Wheel, our first hard-earned victory. After giving me the Wall Fragment back, and whining that it was a hunk of junk not even worth their, the effort they took to steal it, Charm asked me why I was looking for them, and after hearing my answer, she gives me a poetry reading and threatens we will meet again before they run away. After setting the warp point at the diamond settlement and failing to catch my fourth team member, I return to the Salacion ruins to return the wall fragment, where Volo is pleased with my results. Where were you, man? And tells me that he believes Warden Kalaba's attitude isn't from a hatred of the Diamond Clan or Galaxy team, but from a deep love and devotion to the Pearl Clan. Assuming I'm here to bother her again, she is shocked when I present her with a wall fragment and a willingness to still want to calm Ursaluna. After repairing the wall, she reads the inscription to me, and after taking the message to heart, she asks me what my name is and actually asks me to help her calm Ursaluna, believing it just needs a little medicine and relying on me for the battling part. But before going to face Ursaluna, I face the prospect of finally catching my next partner, Golbat, to which after a short battle... Go, Pokeball! I name him Radar and after leveling him and Chansey up, we're ready to face the big bad bear. To which I use the same rule set as facing an alpha since Ursaluna is that beefy. We fail on our first attempt, but second time's the charm, right? For the second battle, we start off with Radar instead of Chansey using Hypnosis instead of Stun Spore, which hits, with Ursaluna using Slash, to which Radar responds with Bite. But Ursaluna is too thick-skinned and takes Radar down with another Slash. After this, Chansey comes in, firing Energy Ball. With Ursaluna being too tired to move, Chansey absorbs the last of Ursaluna's strength, and we net the win. After finally tiring the bear out, Warden Kalaba administers the medicine, which seems to work, and Ursaluna is no longer angry. After discussing the fact that Ursaluna didn't show the same symptoms as Cleavor, Elder Kalaba finds some powder on his fur and wonders why Rezu was the one to warn her about Ursaluna. She then has me play my flute for Ursaluna, to which he gives me the Earth Plate, and I'm given permission to use him as a bloodhound. I return to Jubilife, where the commander seems to want to see me immediately, because it seems Arezu, after visiting Jubilife, is missing having been last seen at the Wallflower, while also never telling Anamon that her noble, elegant Lady of the Ridge was also frenzied, and having rumors about her being the reason Ursaluna went berserk go unanswered. Upon being asked, the commander declares the Galaxy Team's neutrality in the event that a conflict breaks out between the Diamond and Pearl Clans. Upon being asked for ideas, I suggest tracking Arezu down using Ursaluna's treasure-hunting nose with the scent of Benny's potato mochi, to which the commander also tasks me with quelling Lilligan's frenzy before dismissing me. I then check what moves Captain Zaisu can teach my latest team members. Back at the Mirelands, I clear out the Bogbound campsite and finish even more Pokedex entries, resulting in Chansey evolving into Cherum, before going to find Arezu alone and injured. She asks me how it went with Ursaluna and how I found her. I tell her, which seems to give her some relief before despairing, to which Warden Kalaba arrives to apologize for treating her so poorly when she came to tell her about Ursaluna. To which Arezu explains that he only went berserk after sniffing Lilligan's frenzied perfume, and tells us how she heard about the way we quelled Cleavor's frenzy, and after making bombs for Lilligan, she was chased by a wild Pokemon and sprained her ankle. Adamon, having overheard our conversation, proceeds to scold Arezu for her rash trying to do it on her own actions, and will be taking the bombs to Brave Arena for her, while Warden Kalaba treats her leg. After leveling the team up, I make my way to the arena where Anamon is waiting for me, to which after the quickest recovery in history, we are joined by Arezu and Warden Kalaba to where I am given battle tips for my upcoming fight. I start the encounter, and I'm ready to dance off with the graceful Lady of the Ridge.
After lots of rolling around, I get the chance to show the strength of my team where Flash Hoof dodges a stun spore and uses Flame Wheel before dodging a poison powder. I then worry about overleveling him for the fight with Irida and swap him with Radar who takes an energy ball and uses Aerial Ice to stun Lilligan, winning us the dance off with the Lady of the Ridge. In recognition of our fancy footwork, we're given the metal plate before receiving gratitude from Adaman and Arezu for helping Lilligan. Adaman then demands Arezu apologize to Warden Kalaba, who says that it isn't necessary, and gives a speech about working together, before lecturing Arezu about taking on more than she could handle alone, and as a warden, she should know better. Adaman agrees and suggests for Arezu to train hard in case this happens again. Warden Kalaba then suggests working together from now on, and Arezu has a short chat apologizing to Lilligan for being unable to help her. I then leave, shortly having my own talk with Volo. I then return to Jubilife, to where I tell Benny the success of my plan to find Arezu, and after tooting his own horn, I report my success to the commander who suggests that the rift that the lightning and I came out of could be connected. Don't go there, sir. We celebrate our achievements at the Wallflower, to which Rai wonders if our research is even making a difference and gives me the stealth recipe, to which the professor gives him a pep talk. Afterwards, we finish our supper and I go to bed. In the morning, I run into a Rezu who tells me that while still being a warden to Lady Lilligan, will also be taking on a job as a hairdresser here in Jubilife, to which the commander welcomes her with open arms. The commander then asks me to accompany him to Prelude Beach to welcome some newcomers who are coming to be a part of Jubilife Village. After after the newcomers leave, the commander asks me if I like Pokemon, before telling me he will do whatever it takes to protect the village. Rai then shows up to say that Irida has arrived, to which the commander asks me to attend the meeting. But first, after a little more dex grinding, I share my findings with Captain Xilene, to which I am promoted from Galaxy Team Member to Veteran Survey Corps Member. With my new rank, I finally attend the meeting with the commander and Irida, tasking me with surveying the next region, the Cobalt Coastlands and feel the need to tell me that the coastlands has no lord due to a tragedy that befell him, and reports are coming in of shadowy figures being spotted at the late noble seat, Firespit Island, to which I am also tasked with investigating this desecration since the Pearl Clan's warden of the region has other matters to deal with. Irida then tells me she'll meet me there. I receive my briefing, outfit my team with new moves from Zaisu, take on some more side quests, and change my wardrobe to something more fitting for a coastal trip. Upon heading out, Leon comes over and wonders where I'm headed. After hearing I'm heading to the coastlands, he tells me a little about the Warden Polina and her reputation within the clan, before telling me about evolution stones and a legend about the Noble's Plates, before gifting me two Grit Pebbles and three Grit Gravels, which I will be using post-game, but more on that later. I take in the view with the Professor and meet with Irida, who gives a concert. After that, she decides to test how strong her team is by challenging me to another battle, to which in spite of facing two at once, I choose you, Flash Hoof. I go with just Flash Hoof, since I don't have any teammates within Eevee's level cap, which has been dropped again by one for this battle, which took three tries. After the first attempt, I hunt in vain for a seed of mastery before just deciding to change moves, and get slapped hard on the second try. But on the third attempt, I have Flash Hoof lead with Mystical Fire, dropping Glaceon's attacks before getting barraged with two quick attacks and an Ice Beam from Eevee and Glaceon combined, to which we go with Agile Flame Wheel to finish Glaceon evening the odds, to which luckily Eevee goes for Baby Doll Eyes, and we take advantage with Mystical Fire causing Eevee's next attack to come close, but another Mystical Fire earns us the win. After the battle, Irida heals my team and shares her insecurities with me, and how she got the job as leader instead of Warden Polina, warden to the late Lord of the Isles, who she cares deeply for, and wishes to quell the negative rumors about her by asking me to help her raise the heir to the late noble, believing if anyone could help, it would be me. She then gives me directions on where to find Polina. Upon my approach, a young woman tells Growlithe to settle down. Polina then introduces herself, and having heard about my exploits, asks me what I'm here for, since there is no lord or lady, much less a frenzied one, because the last one died saving its pup from the sea, and asks me which Growlithe is the late noble's pup, obviously the little one. 
She then explains the reason she hasn't been pushing Growlithe to train to be the next Lord is because of the trauma it suffered from that event, and won't be pushing it to take that responsibility no matter what others think, and again she asks me what I'm doing at the coastlands. I share my mission to investigate the strange occurrences at Firespit Island, to which she tells me I'll need the aid of Basque Legion and to seek out its warden Iskin of the Diamond Clan, and tells me where he lives. On the way, I bump into Volo, who says he's hunting for plates, and asks how many I have so far, and after seeing I have six, he proceeds to tell me the story of the ancient hero who challenged Almighty Sinnoh with his ten Pokemon before telling me to be careful and leaves. Volo, if this was hardcore, I'd only have six. I then get to meet Iskin, Warden of the Diamond Clan, and tell him I need help from his charge Basque Legion to reach Firespit Island, to which he tells me I need to make fish fifth, to which he tells me I need to make fish food by catching the dreaded Pokemon Dust Bops to use Dark Pulse to complete the recipe, and that I can find one at Deadwood Haunt. But since they only spawn at night, I take advantage of the day with grinding more dex entries and serve a cease and desist order on an annoying Chatot to get the Coastal Coastlands camp set up before taking a nap. And with the cover of night, I catch the honorary member of the team Dusclops, and Denise evolves into Luxray. I bring her friend to Iskin, and after a panic attack, I tell him to get a grip, and after he summons up his courage, we make the fish bait for Basque Legion. After getting Chef's approval, he tells me to meet him at Ginkgo Landing. While we're there, we're visited by Polina and the Growlers, who want to see Basque Legion again, to which Iskin plays his fish flute. Upon its arrival, I toss in the fish bait and am told to let Basque Legion hear my tune. As payment, I'm given the splash plate and can use Basque Legion as a water taxi. With dying to tell someone, Warden Polina and Iskin share their Romeo and Juliet's story with me when we're attacked by Team Ra the Misfortune Sisters, who steal one of the Growlers with the intention to make the Heir of the Isles to evolve into Arcanine at their secret base on Firespit Island. They then escape, to which Iskin and I decide to go after them while Polina stays behind with the real Heir. But before the daring rescue, I catch my first Coastland teammate Machop just to fill up my team and name her Gradenia. I then go for my next teammate, Finneon, and name him Jumpin' Jacks. And after prepping the team, I make my way to Firespit Island, where Iskin shows up and after a lot of negative Nellying, suggests that I lead the way. Upon reaching the arena, we cut to the misfortunes trying to force their prisoner to evolve, whether it wanted to or not, to which we then dash in and Clover challenges me with a bomb of snow. I send in Flash Hoof and have him burn the walking tree down with a mystical fire. Clover then complains about losing because of the heat, to which Coin points out she was the one to send out a bomb of snow in the first place and tries to take me on with Toxicroak. I send out Flash Hoof, and after using Hypnosis, Toxicroak gets the KO with Mud Bomb. I then send out Radar, whose aim is true, and lands a Zen Headbutt through Toxicroak's obscurity, earning the win. I've beaten the second sister, leaving just Charm left to defeat. I choose you, Chansei! I send out Chansei, who's best right on with an agile energy ball, to which Gengar comes in and softens Chansei with Hypnosis before finishing her with Venoshock. I then give Denise her chance to shine, taking Gengar out with Crunch and ending the trio's gauntlet on the first try. After Clover heals the Bomb of Snow and Arcanine, the real heir comes rushing in to rescue his friend, with Polina tailing close behind, telling him it's too dangerous, and tells us that he jumped in the ocean and swam here, ignoring his fear for it, and after pushing aside the last bit of self-doubt, he evolved into Arcanine, gaining recognition from Polina and annoying Clover. Coin then notices a space-time rift open, which strikes Arcanine into a frenzied state, leaving Polina shocked and bewildered. The misfortunes realize the danger and flee the arena to Polina's annoyance before Iskin recommends we evacuate too. Irida then arrives to ask Polina what she's going to do about Arcanine, to which she asks me what can be done, with Irida suggesting we make bombs, to which Polina is confused. And after some back-and-forth drama, Irida then explains what bombs are and how to use them, to which Iskin seems to be carrying what we need inside his endless pouch and we make the bombs. I then level up Jumpin' Jacks and Gradenia and evolve them to Luminion and Machoke before returning to Firespit Island to start the fight and rescue the frenzied Lord of the Isles. After a short time, we start the battle with Arcanine, who hits Jumpin' Jack with Rock Slide, and we try to go for an easy win with a strong Water Pulse, but Arcanine hangs in there, taking out Jumpin' Jack with another Rock Slide, to which I send Gradenia in to get payback with Mach Punch, and we soon tame the feral dog.
After quelling Arcanine's frenzy, I receive the flame plate and Polina speculates about the rift, to which we hear a strange Arcanine cry, and after a ghost sighting, Polina is inspired to have a growing up moment with Arcanine, telling him they will have to live apart from now on, and reassures him that he is ready to be the next Lord of the Isles, with her as his warden. And after having some fun with Iskin's frail nerves about the cry we heard, Polina thanks me for my help and asks me to take care of Irida before she and Iskin leave. I then have a chat with Irida, to which she explains to me why why she wanted me to help Polina raise Growlithe into the next noble and understood why Lena took the position she did, and then talks about how useless a leader she was during the Arcanine fight before sharing her backstory and how I have inspired her to aspire to reach for greater heights. She then tells me she's going to see Polina to learn more about her and Iskin before leaving me. I return to Galaxy Headquarters to sell a few side requests and report to the commander about my survey mission. He seems pleased with me and finally starts to push doubts about me aside. At our evening celebration, Benny shares that he let a Pokemon roast our mochi, and the professor shares his amazement of my writing Basque Legion, and that in spite of his terrible coordination, he declares someday he will be writing a Pokemon too. The next day, I'm approached by a strange ragged man telling me the commander wants to see me. I walk to headquarters to where the commander tells me my next assignment is at the Coronet Highlands because of the frenzied noble electrode to which Anamon tells me that its explosions have become much more dangerous since it's been empowered. Our meeting is then interrupted by a disturbance downstairs and I get to meet the leading candidate for one of the most obnoxious characters Game Freak has ever made, Warden Melly of the Diamond Clan, who happens to be Electrode's warden. Adamon tells him that the plan for me to quell Electrode has been decided, to which Melly whines and doubts that a flimsy noodle like me could do it, causing Adamon to apologize for Melly's behavior, to which the commander doesn't blame Melly but the security corps for failing at their duty and plan some extra training sessions. Adamon lectures Melly for the future hardship for the guards. The commander then gets us back on topic and tells Melly we might need his help later with this mission before dismissing us. Downstairs, Adamon intends to prove I'm awesome to Melly by having me battle him outside, which is another level dropping battle to bring the cap to a negative four. I go with Radar and lose the first try by being greedy against Leafeon. Let's do it, Radar. Go! But on the second attempt, Leafeon sets up Calm Mind, to which I have Radar use Cross Poison and land not just the critical hit, but also Poison Leafeon. Eevee uses Quick Attack, and Leafeon strikes with Leaf Blade and suffers damage from its poisoning. We finish Leafeon with an Agile Air Cutter, to which Eevee tries to get revenge with Quick Attack, but falling short, we use Cross Poison for the win. Adamon is pleased finally proving his point, to which Melee scoffs. Adamon then tells me the member from the Pearl Clan is waiting for me at the training grounds, before bidding me farewell, and tells Melly to get a move on or face a worse lecture, to which Melly whines again. Captain Silene summons me to her office for the briefing to which my next destination is the Coronet Highlands before giving me a lecture about not finishing enough work on the Pokedex. After grinding, saving Zeke's sister, grind some more and have Radar evolve to Crobat, do a Save the Flowers side request, I finally earn enough points to earn my next promotion from Veteran Survey Corps member to Senior Survey Corps member and receive the briefing. Understood, ma'am. I will not report to briefings underranked again. I then fulfill Antha's side request before changing for my next location. I then meet up with Irida and the Pearl Clan's Warden of the Coronet Highlands, Warden Ingo, who is also the Warden to the Pearl Clan's Pokemon Sneasler. He will also be my guide to reaching Electrode. Irida then says he's like me and that he appeared one day with no memories of where he's from, before wishing me luck, to which they then depart. I have Radar learn Leech Life, and I'm ready to head to the Coronet Highlands to where the professor tells me what type of Pokemon to expect here and a tidbit about the mountain peak. I'm then off to meet up with Warden Ingo, who hints at catching a ground type for facing Electrode, and after showing sympathy for it, Melly pops in, talking down to me, and tries to challenge me. Of course I refuse. He then goes on a rant about Electrode being frenzied as a divine gift from Almighty Sinnoh, and his purpose is to let Electrode stay that way, before telling me it's none of my business to interfere and to slink home before he leaves. Ingo comments on his selfish attitude and asks me if I want to carry on, to which he then tells me we have to navigate through Wayward Cave to reach his charged Sneasler and leads the way. Ingo notices the guiding torch is missing, but we roll on anyway. On our way through, Ingo tells me of a Pokemon he can't quite remember. He then notices an Alpha Crobat and we change directions. He then tells me about someone dear to him he can but can't quite remember. 
He then finds the torches Melly hid, and after setting them up, he waits for me outside. We reach the exit, and Ingo tells me his backstory of how he became a part of the Diamond Clan before we run into Melly again, who whines about undoing his misdeed, to which he tries to pass it off as thinking about the cave-dwelling Pokemon, and tries again to challenge me to a battle. I accept this time and go with Radar, to which I make an error in judgment, and we lose the first attempt. On the second attempt, I have Radar lead with Air Cutter, to which Skuntank responds with an agile and regular night slashes, to which we finish Skun Tank with an agile air cutter followed by a strong air cutter, putting Melee in his place. After the battle, Melee refuses to acknowledge his defeat and leaves for Skun Tank to recover, to which Ingo then suggests we proceed inside an ancient quarry. While inside, Ingo speculates as to the work ethics of the place, before Volo comes in speculating Ingo could have amnesia because of the space-time rift. Ingo doubts this but can't deny it, to which Volo then asks me if I remember anything from the rift. I avoid telling him about Arceus, and he then tells us that he read that the space-time rift had also appeared in the past, and wonders why it has reopened, and also why I came through it. Ingo praises his efforts to unravel this mystery, and Volo tries to act humble before leaving. We then press on, and I take on the side request to set up the mountain camp before leveling the team to take on Ingo's trial to earn the aid of his charged Sneasler and hopefully help regain more of his memories. I start the battle with Chansei and have her lead off with Draining Kiss, to which Macho tries to get the KO with Bullet Punch followed by Double Edge, but Chansei hangs in there to which we get the KO using Agile Draining Kiss. Ingo then sends out Gliscor getting revenge using Cross Poison taking Chansei out. Chansei, return! I decide to risk using Denise against the ground type, not only landing Ice Fang, but also getting the Frostbite, which nerfs Gliscor's Mud Bomb, and Denise navigates Gliscor's Obscurity to get the knockout with another Ice Fang, to which his Tangela comes in to get revenge with Energy Ball. I then send out Radar, who I was debating to use against Gliscor, and get two Leech Lifes to sap the life from Tangela, landing the win. Ingo congratulates me before summoning Sneasler with his Mountain Flute. He introduces us and asks me to play for her. After being amused, Sneasler gives me the Toxic Plate, to which Ingo suggests we proceed to Electrode while he returns to Jubilife, and we separate. Before heading up the mountain, I make my way to Wayward Cave. <clears throat> As I was saying, I make my way to Wayward Cave to catch our next teammate Gibble, who proves to be a stubborn fighter, but we catch him in the end. In honor of his struggle, I name him Archie, and we head for our next teammate Clefairy at the Fabled Spring. I name him Russell. Archie then levels up enough to evolve into Kabite, and after level, <clears throat> after leveling him up, I approach Melee, who strangely enough welcomes me to Moonview Arena and tries to sound wise before saying he won't let me quell Electrode and dares me to get past him, to which I battle him with just Archie against his team of three, which makes a good time to explain another rule, that against Melee and Warden Sabi's triple battles, if I don't have a Pokemon within their support team's level cap, I can combine the levels of their two weaker Pokemons in a special way for a second teammate's level cap, but I didn't have any within the limit and lost twice with just Archie. But but on the third attempt, I use what I learned from the last two battles and have Archie use strong earth power, taking out Skuntank, to which Zubat tries to get revenge with Gust and Hypnosis while Skaroopy couldn't care less. I then have Archie punish her with Dragon Claw getting the KO. Zubat then tries with another Gust but falls to a critical Dragon Claw we did it, Archie. and we finally pass Melee's challenge. Melee tries to be smart by saying I may have won but he didn't lose. There's a difference. Sure, Melee. And after coming up with another excuse, he tells me he knows that we need to make bombs for Electrode, but forgot what Electrode likes to eat. I don't believe him, and he mocks me, before Anamon comes to the rescue to share with me what Electrode likes to Melly's annoyance. Trying to lecture Ottoman as leader of the Diamond Clan, why does he bother with us galaxy louts? To which Ottoman responds with asking Melly if he even feels guilt to his noble suffering. To which he tries to pass it off not as suffering, but as a trial from Almighty Sinnoh. But Ottoman can't afford to accept that given the danger, and tells us he brought the crunchy salts needed for the bombs, and tells us to help him make them, to which Melly begrudgingly goes along with it. We make the bombs, and Melly brags his charge is unbeatable. I equip my team, and am ready to do Defuse the Lord of the Hollow. I evade most of Electrode's attacks and start the battle with Archie, who takes an energy ball, to which we use Dragon Claw before falling to another energy ball. I send out Flash Hoof and for leveling reasons swap to Denise, who takes an energy ball before stunning Electrode with Ice Fang, and after some determination, we finally defuse the electrified ball. 
After that, Electro shows his gratitude by giving me the zap plate before rolling off. Melly, in a state of disbelief, regrets ever helping me, to which Anamon tries cheering him up by saying Electrode feels better, but Melly worries what he'll do if he angered Almighty Sinnoh with our actions, to which Ingo shows up to tell us what he remembers about his past, particularly about Pokemon trainers, and the bonds they shared with their Pokemon through battling, to which Anamon asks if my world was like that, but since I don't know where I'm from, I tell him I don't know, but he still isn't inspired by Ingo's words, and Melee realizes that in order for his Pokemon to reach their full potential, he needs to train as well, and wants Ottoman to remind him of the legend passed down within the Diamond Clan about Almighty Sinnoh, the ruler of time. Ingo then encourages us to run towards our goals, with mine being the next noble, and says he is going to Jubilife this time to report to the commander and leaves. Ottoman reflects on his philosophy, and Melee acts like Melee. I then return to Jubilife to finish more side requests and report my progress to Captain Silene and am promoted from Senior Explorer of the Survey Corps to Chief Explorer of the Survey Corps. I soon report to the commander and tell him Melly's idea about the frenzies being a trial from Almighty Sinnoh, causing the commander to reflect on the questions the idea would bring up and about the space-time rift itself, before dismissing me to the Wallflower where Benny is instructed to make his best potato mochi. Gee, the boss sure is generous. Ryan and the professor then talk about my going from zero to hero with the professor sharing words of wisdom with us and telling me that I'm a part of Jubilife now before we dig in. The next morning, I'm greeted by Ottoman who's having a lovely day, and Irida who's having a rough morning because she had to get up extra early to arrive on time for the meeting with the commander, to which both are looking forward to. At the commander's office, we talk about how remarkable it is that a stranger like me who fell from the sky has already quelled four frenzied nobles, and that my next mission is to quell Avalog, the largest and final of the nobles, hoping it would affect the rift, before we decide to meet back up at the Alabaster Icelands. The commander then tells me in private that no matter what I do, there will always be people who will have doubts about a stranger like me. Heading downstairs for my briefing, I witness a unique scene with Captain Silene in a wormhole and learn her secret. After that, I receive my briefing and prepare to head for the Alabaster Icelands. By first changing for the climate before meeting Ryan the Professor at the gate for our survey of the Alabaster Icelands, to which the Professor questions if we should even get involved since Avalog, unlike the other nobles, hasn't hurt anybody yet, to which Ry reasons it's a risk to leave a noble its size frenzied since it could cause an avalanche. The Professor then says that avalanches can happen by themselves and is worried that I might get hurt if we go through with this, to which Ry then talks about the suffering nobles experience, and the professor tries to point out we don't know if the frenzies are even causing them to suffer, and if their frenzies are even connected to the rift, before questioning the commander's motives for wishing to quell these frenzies since it's not for scientific study, before shrugging it off as possibly being a silly sausage. Rai then offers battling me for the last time, causing my team's level cap to drop one more time for a total of five below. Tell me what you've learned, Ray. I open with Jumpin' Jack, and Rai starts with Mr. Mine using Psychic. I have Jumpin' Jack use Air Slash, then follow up with Strong Style Air Slash, falling short of the KO, with Mr. Mine using another Psychic for the KO on Jumpin' Jack. I send out Flash Hoof, and we get revenge with Mystical Fire. Rai then calls out Staravia to commit suicide with Brave Bird, but Flash Hoof hangs in there and sets up Double Hit for an easy kill with Mystical Fire, to which Rai sends out his Ace Pikachu for payback with Thunderbolt. I then send out Chance Day, and to avoid a Double Hit, attack combo use Agile Energy Ball. Pikachu uses Iron Tail and we conclude the match with another Energy Ball. Why you give me a good challenge, Ray? Good battle. Rai then wishes me luck on the survey and the professor says he'll meet me there. I make my way to the Alabaster Icelands where the professor's freezing his toes off before telling me we go where Pokemon can be found no matter what and suggests I learn more about Avalog from Ottoman and Irida who come over with Ottoman complaining about the cold and Irida saying it's actually hot out here to which Ottoman then suspects the reason they argue isn't because they're from different clans but just because they can't agree on anything. Irida then tries to bring up differences in beliefs but Ottoman wants to get on with the plan, to which Irida says we're to see our mentor Garrick at Avalog's Legacy, to which Ottoman then walks off with Irida getting annoyed before saying they'll see me at Avalog's Legacy and rushes off. I eventually make my way to Avalog's Legacy, to which Ottoman considers our reaching here as an achievement, 
and Irida introduces her mentor, Warden Garrick of the Pearl Clan, who also happens to be Avalug's warden, and asks me a series of questions to why I intend to quell Avalug's frenzy, and why that's even necessary since he hasn't caused any harm to anyone, to which Irida reasons that it's necessary to quell Avalug to remove any fear of him harming anyone in the future. Garrick concedes and decides to test if I am up to the task with a battle, and in spite of having a Glalie weaker than the wild ones roaming around, he still wins the first match. I challenge him to a rematch, to which I send out Flash Hoof and Sweet Glalie with a Fire Blast, to which Frostlass responds with Hex before Flash Hoof fires off with Mystical Fire, netting the win. I impress Garrick with our victory, and he gives us permission to proceed. He then tells me I need to get Eternal Ice for Quelling Avalug, which is located at the top of Avalug's legacy. Ottoman then tries to give me the short form of what I need to accomplish that, with Irida telling him to give the long form to save time, to which Ottoman then elaborates that to reach the top of Avalug's legacy, I'll need to fly there with the aid of the Diamond Clan's Pokemon Braviary, and to seek out its Warden Sabi at Snowpoint Temple, and to expect her to be a little different. Adamon then notices Sabi, who says her clairvoyance told her to be here, and asks me to come to her. Garrick tells me to go on ahead while he pulls a few more reps before showtime. I go to meet Sabi, who is pleased to meet me, and I return the compliment, to which she then tells me she knows why I'm here, and that I can have Braviary's help if I can catch them, to which they then both fly off. I then track them to a cliff where she plays mind games with me through asking a few questions about certain things before they fly off again heading to Snowpoint Temple. On my way to the temple, I drop in a hole and catch my two Iceland teammates, Bergmite and Zora, who I name Logo and Zashi. I then set up the Ice Peak campsite and finally show Arezu and Mistrevis before getting a Moonstone from the store to evolve Russell into Clefable. I then make my way to Snowpoint Temple, finally catching up with Savi, who is pleased having someone new to play with, and tells me there's puzzles inside for me to solve before she and Braviary go inside. I solve the door puzzles and reach Savi again, who says her clairvoyance saw me with Braviary, but but she still wants me to prove myself by going up against Rhyperior, Magmortar, and Electivire simultaneously. For this battle, I go with Russell and Archie using the special rule set I applied to Melly. I lead with Russell, who gets outsped for a beatdown by Electivire's Thunder Punch and Rhyperior using Strong Style High Horsepower. I send out Archie and have him use Strong Earth Power to take out Rhyperior. Electivire then tries in vain to paralyze Archie with two turns of Thunder Wave, and Magmortar uses two Flamethrowers, taking two thirds of Archie's health before falling to Earth. Earth power, with Electivire following suit with another Earth power. With Russell's sacrifice, we pass Savi's trial. We amaze Savi, and she heads to the roof where Braviary is waiting, but before following her, I decide to go with Flash Hoof, and after leveling him up a little, we make our way to the roof to accept Braviary's challenge, and open the battle with Mystical Fire, dropping Braviary's attack power, to which Braviary uses Agile Brave Bird, followed by Roost. We then take our only chance to win with an Agile Fire Blast, followed by a Strong Style Fire Blast, grounding the Psychic Bird. After the battle, Savi pretends to be a spoiled sport about it, I don't be a spoiled sports sobby. Come on back. Prankster. Before telling me to play my flute with her for Braviary. To which Braviary then gives me the sky plate before Ottoman comes in to give a speech, followed by Sabi telling me to jump off the temple to fly with Braviary, to which Ottoman reminds me to get the eternal ice. Can I have second thoughts about this, Sabi? Okay, but on three. One Two. Ah, Sabi! That was a dirty trick, you little prankster. I immediately head to Avalog's legacy to get the ice and run into Garrick, who also reached the top for the first time. I give him the ice, and he tells me he still has his doubts, but will be waiting for me at Brave Arena with the bombs before diving off the iceberg. I then go on a big grind, getting decent levels for the team and farming Seeds of Mastery for the final battle with the champion of Vesui, and while this is going on, Archie evolves into Garchomp. Afterwards, I meet up with Garrick and Volo on the trail, where Volo was delivering an order of sword caps to Garrick, and they take the opportunity to tell me what to expect when I face Avalug, and a general size to expect the largest of the five nobles to be. Garrick then proceeds to the arena, with Volo chickening out and leaving for a warmer region. I make my way to the arena, and after some squats, Garrick makes the bombs, and after a few fighting tips, I enter the arena and am ready to conquer the Lord of the Tundra. After dodging for my life, Avalug tires out, and we take the chance for our our final noble battle. Let's go, Gradenia.
Going with Gradenia, we open with Mock Punch, to which Atlug responds with Mountain Gale. We then go for Broke with Close Combat, but it just falls short of the stun, with Avalug using another Mountain Gale, taking Gradenia down. I then send out Russell for a quick Drain Punch, finishing Gradenia's efforts, and we eventually defeat the Walking Mountain. In recognition of our bravery, Avalug awards us the Icicle Plate and disappears. Irida then sees that Garrick is upset, to which he then asks her if I am some kind of monster, with her answering that I am not a monster, but actually a hero who who has inspired her to make big changes, prompting Garrick to say that she already has changed. To which Ataman and Sabi then show up, with Ataman wondering if the space-time rift will close now. To which Irida says she doesn't know, but she and Ataman hold optimism for the future and believe they're ready for the worst as long as I'm around, and actually get along before planning to report our success to the commander. I return to headquarters to report my progress to Captain Silene and receive my final promotion from Chief Explorer to Master Explorer of the Survey Corps. I then report my success with Avalug to the commander, who wonders why it all started in the first place, and why someone like me was able to handle it, before showing optimism for the future and tells me to take care since our survey work is not done yet, before dismissing me. At our usual meeting and eating time, the professor thanks Benny for the generous portions of potato mochi, followed by Rai saying we can now survey all of the sui and the professor puts his doubts of quelling Avalug aside. Rai then mentions the danger the frenzied nobles posed if I wasn't here to help them, and wonders if the rift closes, would I be stuck here? To which the professor reassures us we'll find an answer to that possibility, and if not, I have a home here in Jubilife. Rai then asks to be my assistant with completing the Pokédex, to the professor's surprise, to which he successfully talks them out of it. We have supper, and everything seems to be looking up. I rush outside to investigate the disturbance, which is... Well, that's certainly new, and see things have gone from better to the worst they've ever been. Inside Captain Silene's office, I'm summoned to the commander's office, where Ottoman and Irida are also present. The commander then presents his detective accusation and logic that I'm the cause for the sky turning red. Commander, how many times do I have to repeat myself? I am not, and never was, a part of Team Sky. You must believe me. Ataman and Irida try to defend me with their own logic, but the commander's prejudice won't let him accept their reasoning and banishes me from the village until I fix the sky, with only my quelling the nobles being the only reason I'm not imprisoned. Rai and the professor are shocked at hearing the news, and Captain Silene escorts me to the gatehouse with no one speaking up for me. Don't worry, guys. I'll be back. And it won't be for revenge. The guard offers to take me the rest of the way, but Captain Silene intends to escort me all the way with Rai and the Professor tagging along to the Obsidian Fieldlands camp. Once there, Rai and the Professor say they intend to protest the commander's decision to exile me, to which the captain advises them not to because they can't help me if they're banished too. It's then suggested I seek refuge with Leon or May of the Pearl or Diamond Clans, before Captain Silene orders me to stay alive and tells me to stay true to who I am, regardless of how others treat me. The professor tells me they still need me, before I'm off to talk to Leon, who tells me his worries about what could happen with the sky being red and the rift also being larger than ever, and tells me with sympathy that the Pearl Clan can't risk conflict with the Galaxy team by giving me refuge, and suggests I seek out May at the Warren Bridge. I find May at the Warren Bridge, and she asks me if I know how this could have happened, and I tell her I'm trying to find out, but she tells me the same thing as Leon for why she can't help me either. But she also tells me not to give up, and that she believes I'll find a way. After having a tender moment with some wild Pokemon near me, eventually Bolo arrives, having heard about my plight, and tells me that since I have no one to turn to, and no place to go, he offers to stash me away at a hideaway he knows about. We arrive and he thinks I dislike the accommodations, before he exchanges pleasantries with the owner of the place, Mistress Kajita, and introduces me to her, to which she pities me, but is grateful the Lost One has arrived so she can finally fulfill her duty and invites me inside to explain. Once inside, she tells me what the rift is and where Almighty Sinnoh is said to be found. I ask if it's the Pearl Clan's version, and she explains you can't separate time from space, since together they are the source of all creation, and to think one rules the other is impossible. I agree with her, and she moves on to that in order to restore the sky. I must seek the aid of three late guardians to gather the pieces of an object called the Red Chain, which is said to have the power to bind the world. Bolo then questions the plan, and Mistress Kajita tells him she knows what the legends that have been passed down say. She is duty-bound to share them with us, and after complaining, she asked me to fulfill my duty, to which I accept the role. 
Bolo then tells me how my needs can be met, like where I can craft and buy materials from, and suggests how I can get rest when we hear a cry outside and investigate to find Captain Silene's Abra with a note on it from the captain, which says that she has arranged for me to have access to the pastures and use of the campsites, as well as that she still believes in me. Bolo asks me about the letter, and I say it's a secret, to which he then says it would be nice to have help with our task with having Ottoman and Irida show up on cue. After calming their people's fears for the moment, they offer their aid, but to avoid the commander becoming suspicious, we could only have one of them come with us. I choose Ottoman, while Irida keeps an eye on the commander. Irida then tells Ottoman to stay out of trouble, to which we then depart. I head to finish an old side request and reach Lake Valor, where Bolo gives us a few history lessons about the lake and its guardian. I then use the open sesame feature of my arc phone, and we enter with Bolo waiting outside, and run into an alpha overquill. I decide to challenge myself with only allowing each member of the team to pair off against each lake alpha, and go with Radar and Archie for the first. Go, Radar. I choose you. I open with Radar, who takes damage from Double Edge, before swapping for Archie, who also gets hit by Double Edge, to which we get payback with an Agile Earth Power, followed by Bulldoze to finish the Alpha. The Guardian of the Lake, Azalp, appears and tells me to strike it with bombs it had brought, and after proving my determination, Azalp awards me with a Fang. We then head outside, where Ottoman says Volo is quite knowledgeable about his Sui, to which Volo tells us it's because of a strong sense of curiosity to know his path in life, with Ottoman sharing the same sentiment about his clan's origins, before we head back to Mistress Kajita's place to show her Azalf's fang, proving the legend's true. Ottoman then shows his confusion to the logic of this plan, to which Mistress Kajita then gives us a lecture on the mind's perception of reality and speculation to the Red Chain's purpose, leaving Ottoman even more confused, to which Mistress Kajita tells him him, that's the point of legends, that in their own incomprehensible way, they cause one to think more deeply than before. Bolo agrees and tells us we have two trials left, prompting Mistress Kajita to comment on his confident attitude. We then head to Lake Acuity, where Bolo shares with us some more local history, before I open the door with the arc phone, and once inside, Anaman and I find an Alpha Zoroark. For this one, I go with Chansey and Russell. I start with Chansey, but Zoroark gets to move first, setting up Nasty Plot. We then use Stun Spore before Chansey falls to Shadow Claw, and after some debate with myself, I choose Russell and have him set up Agile Calm Mind, following up with Moon Blast, to which Zoroark responds with Agile Shadow Claw, followed by regular Shadow Claw, but Russell manages to hang in there and we win with another Moon Blast. After that, Yuxi appears to test my knowledge of Pokemon. Once I pass the How Many Eyes test, I am awarded with Yuxi's Claw. Yuxi disappears and we head back outside where Bolo wonders why we must pass trials to get pieces of the red chain. Anamon suggests it's a precaution to which they then ponder what other uses the red chain might have before we return to Mistress Kajita to where I show her Yuxi's claw. And Anamon comments about the Guardian's telepathy. Bolo then encourages us to pick up the pace because he heard from one of the Ginkle Guild merchants that the commander is preparing to confront a Pokemon that was seen on the other side of the rift. Bolo then wonders what would happen if the Pokemon came through and Anamon agrees with him that that we must hurry, to which Mistress Kajita calls Volo out for just coming to watch, before telling us to head for the Shrouded Ruins once we obtain the last piece. After a little level grinding, I arrive at the entrance and Bolo gives us even more history lessons about the local legends. I then pop the arc phone out and we head inside to meet our last obstacle, an Alpha Gudra. For this last Alpha, I go with Jumpin' Jack and Gradenia. I send out Jumpin' Jack who is hit with Dragon Pulse. We go with Roost and Gudra takes the opportunity to set up shelter. We use Roost again to stall and Jumpin' Jack gets one shot with a crit Dragon Pulse. I send out Gradenia to use Agile Bulk Up to which Gudra uses Iron Tail, and we go for broke with close combat, which falls short, and Gradenia falls to another Iron Tail. I take out Gudra with Russell, but because of my alpha rules, I decide to revert to last save, which is back at the freaking village before the Red Sky incident. After some backtracking, I face Gudra first with Gradenia and Russell, who both fall, causing a team wipe. Go, Russell. You can do it. We challenge Gudra again and finally win, to which Mesprit appears, and after a much-needed therapy session, I'm given Mesprit's plume. We then go back to Lake Valor to get Azelf's fang by winning with Archie, then head to Lake Acuity to beat up Zoroark with Jumpin' Jack and Radar for Yuxi's claw. 
After that fiasco, Bolo tells us we have all the pieces and reminds us to head to the Shrouded Ruins, to which he's excited for. We reach the Shrouded Ruins, and Bolo tries his hand at words of wisdom about mist blurring boundaries before asking what now, to which Mistress Kajita shows up and Adamon asks her how we can forge the red chain, to which she tells us she doesn't know how to forge the red chain, but doubts any of us mortals can do it, causing Adamon to get frustrated. Just then, Yuxi, Azelf, and Mesprit appear, and to our amazement, forge the red chain before our eyes, and give it to me before disappearing again. Mistress Kajita is relieved her duty has been fulfilled, and Bolo congratulates me before telling us there's still a problem. Ottoman asks him to elaborate, to which Bolo explains the commander is done waiting for our investigation and intends to head for Mount Coronet. Ottoman shows disapproval of that rash action, to which Bolo then points out the commander doesn't know what we've accomplished, to which Ottoman hopes telling him about it will make him listen to reason. Back at the village, we cut to a sad Rai on guard duty when... Hey, Ray. Bye, Ray. After noticing me, he tells me how happy he is to see me and goes to fetch the professor and Captain Silene. After bringing only the professor, they debate who was the most torn over my leaving the village before telling me the captain couldn't come because Commander Commodo has already headed to Mount Coronet with the security corps, leaving Captain Silene in charge. We head inside to report to the captain, to which she is pleased I'm still alive, and I tell her of Ottoman's assistance, to which she credits to my past actions, before asking me if I have learned anything of use, to which I tell her about the plan with the red chain. After that explanation, the captain shares that after the reports of the Pokemon sighting within the rift, the commander decided to take the initiative with the Survey Corps by heading to Mount Coronet, but Rai doubts the commander will prevail without me. Captain Silene then reinstates me to the Survey Corps by her authority as leader during the commander's absence, we head outside where Anamon gives us the latest news about the commander having already reached Mount Coronet, to which Anamon plans to go on ahead of me to avoid having the commander overreact to my arrival before rushing off, to which Captain Silene wonders who's the more rash. We are then approached by a little girl I noticed when leaving Jubilife, who believes I'm trying to help everyone and gives me a max revive. Captain Silene then issues me three orders, one to reach the Temple of Sinnoh, two to use the red chain to fix everything, and three, come back alive. Yes ma'am, I will especially carry out number three. At the summit camp, Bolo shows up hearing the news of my reinstatement and gives me three max potions before telling me Ottoman and Irida are already heading to the peak of the mountain and wishes me luck with the mission before leaving for the peak as well. Melly then comes over and offers his moral support. Gee, thanks, Melly. But before I head up to the peak, I level the team up to prepare for our confrontation with the master of stealth himself, Ninja Benny, best known as the tavern keeper of the Wallflower, who is very eager to battle me and ends up beating me at our first battle, with a lucky first turn beating Denise, Radar, Russell, and Archie. But on our next try, I open with Radar using Strong Style Bite, to which Benny heals Miss Magius with a max potion. To avoid a double attack, I have Radar use Agile Bite, to which Miss Magius uses Hypnosis, stalling out our next attack to get the kill on Radar with Power Jam. I then send Denise out to get payback with Snarl for losing last time. Benny then sends out Sneasler, who opens with Quick Attack, followed up with a strong close combat for the knockout on Denise. I then choose Archie for a quick reversal on Sneasler using Bulldoze, to which Benny sends out Gardevoir to use Dazzling Gleam, but Archie hangs in there to inflict his own damage with Bulldoze before falling to another Dazzling Gleam. I'm down to just Russell, who barely misses the KO on Gardevoir with a Moon Blast, but gets the attack drop, with Gardevoir firing back with Psychic and get the defense drop on Russell, but Russell drops Gardevoir with an Agile Moonblast, leaving just Gallade, who goes for a sword dance before falling to Moonblast as well, proving our might to Benny. Afterwards, he acknowledges our skill and admits he might actually like me before telling me why the commander is obsessed with quelling the threat's Pokemon pose is because of a tragic past, and asks me to save the commander from himself in exchange for as much potato mochi as I can eat. But before the confrontation, I level up the team I'm going to use to which I get ambushed by Charm and thrash her team with Gradenia and Radar before moving on. I eventually reach the trail leading to the temple, where I meet up with Anamon and Irida, who tell me they think Almighty Sinnoh is coming, but the commander won't let them through, and I'm the only one who can stop a disaster from unfolding. I then head further up the trail to face the commander, who has heard about the Red Chain plan, but doubts he can trust me, to which Anamon stands up for me, telling him of the perils I undertook to get the chance to fix this mess. But the commander fears what could happen if I betray his trust, and decides to test Destiny's choice by battling me to see if it is beyond his control. 
I accept his challenge and start off with Denise, using Strong Style Wild Charge for a costly knockout on Braviary. The commander then sends out Snorlax for an easy reversal with high horsepower on Denise. I send out Russell and nerf Snorlax attacks with Baby Doll Eyes before getting hit with a crit high horsepower. We then set up further with Calm Mind and fire off Drain Punch, forcing the commander to heal Snorlax. We try for a one-shot with a strong Drain Punch, but it falls short having Snorlax follow up with Giga Impact. We then use our last turn of Calm Mind with an Agile Drain Punch taking out Snorlax. Having Golem come in for payback using a crit Agile Stealth Rock and finishing up with a strong Double Edge. I then call out Guidinia to use a Bullet Punch Agile Bulk Up combo in the wrong order, before tanking Golem's Stealth Rock to finish it off with a strong style Mock Punch. The commander sends out his last Pokemon Clefable, who sets up Calm Mind before tanking our Bullet Punch, followed by Clefable using Baby Doll Eyes on us. We try to brace for the next turn with another Agile Bulk Up, but Clefable's Psychic Attack proves too strong and Gradenia falls. I send out our last Hope Radar, who outspeeds with Agile Style followed by a regular Cross Poison Attacks for the win. With that, the commander accepts Fate's choice and shows excessive respect to me and apologizes for doubting me before begging me to save the day for everyone, including Pokemon. Anamon reassures him and the four of us enter the temple to face whatever happens next, when suddenly Anamon is used as a spokesperson for the ruler of time, Almighty Sina- Nope. But none other than the legendary Pokemon Dialga, who dares me to catch him for the fight to come. The commander gives me some Ultra Balls before Dialga makes an epic entrance through the space-time rift to be restrained by the red cha- Well, that wasn't in the plan. I guess it's battle time! I lead off with Denise, who gets clobbered with a surprise Earth Power. I then send out Gradenia to use Bulk Up, and she takes a Roar of Time, to which we get a perfect setup with an agile close combat putting Dialga in the red for a perfect fail causing Dialga to punish Gradenia with another Roar of Time. Even though I have the same battling rules as Ursaluna, I decide to add a Capture Clause, which allows me to use extra teammates for extra Pokeball throws to avoid having to revert to last save again, and to have it be more fair. I finally catch Dialga, and just as it seems everything's looking up, Dialga warns us his frenzied counterpart is coming and for us to stand against it, with the commander dismaying that there's another one. Palkia then shows up in a very bad mood, and the commander loses his nerve, telling us to book it while we still can, and argues against any backtalk for staying as suicide, before we all retreat back to the summit camp. Once there, the professor shares his observations he had of Palkia and the space-time rift's reaction to its arrival, while Ottoman is shocked that not just his, but also the Pearl Clan's almighty Sinnohs are both real, and after regaining his composure, the commander apologizes for not listening to Ottoman and Irida about trusting me, and apologizes to me for my unfair banishment. Anamon and Irida show the commander they understand his action before the professor tells us to get back to the task at hand, to which Anamon and the commander agree. And after praising me some more, Irida points out that the red chain is broken before Anamon provides the details of a plan that Dialga had devised, which includes bringing him when we confront Palkia again. As for the components of the plan, Irida collected fragments of the red chain during the excitement, the professor deduces a Pokeball for the second component, and for the final component, it is decided to call on Leon for his mineral expertise, while the professor figures out exactly what mineral to ask Leon about from examining the words engraved on the earth plate, before agreeing Leon is the right person for the job. And while on the subject, Anamon remembers Volo asking about the plates. The professor decides to name the mineral Origin Ore, and the commander asks Irida to fetch Leon, to which he sets out to do immediately. While Anamon and I are waiting, Meli comes over with his arrogant attitude wanting an important role with what's going on, to which Anamon assigns the role of looking after Electrode to Meli's disapproval, and tries to lecture him over a paltry role and pretends to be nice by giving me three truffles while saying everyone is beneath him. Sometime later, Irida shows up with Leon, to which Meli insults Leon's fashion and complains about us consulting with Leon instead of him, to which Leon points out why he was summoned before starting an argument with Meli over whose noble would be more powerful in a fight. And after some trash talking between them, Anamon tells Meli to play nice with the Pearl Clan for now, to which Meli whines for him to revel having been spoken to by Almighty Sinnoh, or rather Dialga. But Anamon asks Leon to proceed, to which Leon tells us we're headed for the primeval grotto, 
Once we arrive, Irida tells us she can feel an extraordinary power emanating from the cave and asks Leon what he thinks. After taking various variables into consideration, he tells us he can do it, to which the Misfortune Sisters step in to stop us. With Ottoman recognizing Clover and asking her where she's been, with Clover telling him it's none of his business, then Charm tells us to hand over any ore we end up mining. Irida tries to talk them out of it to Coin's annoyance and says that's why she left the Pearl Clan, causing Ottoman to have had enough, and has us challenge them to battle, with my squaring off against Charm. I start out with Archie, leading with an agile bulldoze, to which Rhydon copies us with regular bulldoze, but Archie is not impressed and takes Rhydon down with Earth Power. She then sends out Gengar to try with an agile shadow ball, followed by a failed hypnosis, with Archie capitalizing on the mistake, with a strong style Earth Power that also crits, netting us the win. Afterwards, Anamon tries to convince Clover to rejoin the Diamond Clan, but she refuses. Coin tells us we can keep the ore, and Charm shows confidence I can set things right, before warning me they will try to rob me next time we meet, before disappearing. Anamon shows frustration before healing our teams. Irida then suspects they were worried about us based on the coin she used to know, with Anamon complaining about how they showed it. Slagu and Leon eventually extract some origin ore and gives it to me, with Anamon commenting how easy that was, to which Leon claims he and the goo or that skilled. Ottoman then suggests we bring the ore back to the professor. At the campsite, we show the professor the origin ore, and after understanding as to what origin the professor means, we head for the professor's lab. Once there, Irida gives him the fragments of the red chain she's been holding onto, and I give Rai the origin ore. And with all three components Dialga had Ottoman tell us to gather, the professor asks Rai, the greatest crafter in all Juba life, to do the honors, with the rest of us waiting outside. After some time, Anamon complains about how long it's taking, and Irida suspects his speeches about wasting time are a cover for his own impatience, to which Anamon replies he would wait forever if it would accomplish anything. The professor then rushes out saying they're done, and names what Rai made an origin ball before giving it to me. Anamon and Irida come over, and for the first time, marvel over the invention of Pokeballs before Dialga lets us know we will have its support when I face Palkia, and the professor reminds me to head for the temple. Outside, I have the team learn some new moves from Captain Zaisu before meeting Mistress Kajita at the gates, who asks me if I'm ready for the battle with Palkia and warns us that time and space cannot be separated, and that if I fail, space itself could be warped from Palkia's frenzy, possibly breaking the entire world. But with its counterpart Dialga, we have a chance to prevail in restoring time and space to normal and to take him with us to the temple. She then decides to stay in Jubilife for the duration of our mission to go shopping for new clothes at Antha's shop to Ottoman's surprise, prompting her to ask if there's a better time if we fail. We then finally set out for the Temple of Sinnoh, and on the way, I run into Volo, who has been missing since I went to face Dialga, and tells me he'll be setting up shop ahead to watch the fight and might eventually get closer for a better view, believing I'll protect him from any harm. I reach the temple where the commander tells me he regrets his past decisions and asks me if I'm ready. After saying I am, Ottoman shares a diamond clan saying that Irida likes after hearing its explanation, and the commander wishes me to succeed. I enter the temple and after faking Palkia out with an ultra ball, Dialga protects me and then reveals Palkia's origin form and together we're ready to quell the master of space. After bringing Palkia to the brink, I start the battle with Russell, who dodges Palkia's hydro pump and have him use agile baby doll eyes and set up an agile calm mine to easily take a critical hydro pump and almost win with a moon blast, but has to take another hydro pump from Palkia before quick firing another moon blast for the stun. And at the point of us both being pushed to our limits, Palkia gives out first and I chuck the origin ball, and after a few intense moments, I catch the wild stallion of time causing the rift to disappear and revealing the sky to be a beautiful sunny day. Anamon and Irida are taking in the fact I caught Palkia, the professor congratulates me, Rai is proud of me, and the commander cries, causing Anamon and Irida to comment on it to Anamon's misfortune, confirming to the commander this is not a dream, and calls us together for a speech that together we overcame the calamity, and for Anamon and Irida to gather their clans for a festival in Jubilife, to which Irida and Anamon say since the reason their clans used to feud is gone, they accept to which the commander proclaims today a new day for his sui. We start to leave the ruins of the temple, but I take one last look back before moving on. For some, this may be the end. 
but for me, the point of this run was to defeat the champion of Misui with a special rule set, but I thought I'd give a narrated story of my adventures reaching my goal and plan to continue narrating till the end of the run. I hope you enjoy the rest, and I also wanted to say that I will be dropping the level cap one more time for the post-game battles, for a total of six below every story battle, including the last one, which I will explain more when the time comes. And without further ado, let's continue! The next morning, I meet up with Rai, who wishes me good morning before telling me that he thinks the whole space-time rift incident is over. But what's not over is our Pokédex research, and he tells me there's a meeting at the captain's office and he'll see me there. But first, I decide to change for the occasion of the post-game before attending the meeting. Upon arrival, the captain asks me if I enjoyed myself at the festival, to which the professor shares, to the captain's embarrassment, that she did. She then changes the topic to our Pokédex progress, to which the professor claims we've come a long way, and we might have a long way to go, with some Pokémon only being mentioned in Hisui's legends, not knowing if they're even real, with Rai then asking how we're to know which ones are true. Queuing Bolo's entrance, telling us he's our man for such matters, having studied such things instead of while also being a merchant, and offers us his expertise and knowledge, to the professor's excitement. The captain then orders me to work with Volo, who wants to have a chat with me later. Our meeting is concluded, and I take on a side request for the road, before swapping teammates and joining Volo at Deer Track Heights to discuss a mural he wants to show me, and tells me the tale of a brave soul who went on an adventure like mine to seek out the fragments of the Pokemon Almighty Arceus, the all-encompassing deity. When he asks, I tell him the name sounds familiar, to which he's not surprised I've heard of it, and tells me that he believes believes the plates given to me by the nobles are the fragments from legend, and takes the writing engraved on the back of them as proof, and suggests we find the rest of them with starting our search of the grueling groves. I take a side trip to finish the Orboro Tunnel side request before meeting back up with Bolo, to which we're interrupted by an Alpha Vespaquin, with Bolo asking me to handle it. I start off with Jumpin' Jack using Ice Beam before dodging Bug Buzz, because Fog rolled in, which also caused Jumpin' Jack to miss his next Ice Beam, but Vespaquin lands her next Bug Buzz, dropping our defense stats. And because of the Fog, I take the chance and have Jumpin' Jack heal with Roost, but Vespaquin gets lucky and lands a strong style Bug Buzz, taking him out. I then send out Flash Hoof to use Mystical Fire, but the level difference is too great, and Vespaquin survives to take out Flash Hoof with a single nerfed Power Gem that critted. I try to wipe since I couldn't run, but Vespaquin died to bitter malice, and to my frustration, I thought I had to load from a save clear back at the Lake Guardians, but lucky for me, the game automatically saves when reaching the post-game, and after a little fashion backtracking of sorts, I returned to Volo and saved before having a rematch with Vespaquin, and after enduring a bug buzz, we body her with two air slashes. No fog to protect you this time! Upon examining the area, I discover the stone plate, and Volo wonders why Vespaquin had it, and guesses she just found it there. With that being the only lead Volo had, but he suspects there's still more plates out there, and suggests we consult Mistress Kajita on this matter, while also giving me the chance to thank her for her previous help. I enter her house, where she tells me I performed my duty well, and asks us what we're doing here. After hearing it's about the plates, she shares her lineage with us, and says she's heard the legends of the plates of Arceus were given to the noble's ancestors. Bolo wants to know more about the plates we don't have, and she tells us the Diamond and Pearl clans would not have gotten Dialga and Palkia mixed up with Arceus if there was more. Bolo is still determined to learn more, to which Mistress Kajita suggests we seek out the other Pokemon of Isui's myths to perhaps find what we seek, and gives me a check list of what to ask her about to find more plates. After grabbing all the requests, she tells me Pokemon who normally hide away have revealed themselves before wishing me luck. Bolo then thanks Mistress Kajita for her help before having a chat with me outside, where he shares his enthusiasm for collecting the plates and showing even more eagerness to meet Arceus before we go our separate avenues of investigation. I return to Jubilife where Commander Kamado tells me he received a dispatch from Mistress Kajita and tells me to meet him at Prelude Beach. But before going to the beach, I head to the Icelands for some level training for the team and get more Seeds of Mastery, which I end up using after having Gradinia evolve into Machamp. I'm then ready to meet the commander on the dock, and after a moment of nostalgia, he challenges me to a battle, and after being beaten by a better strategy and RNG luck, I challenge the commander to a rematch and open with Russell instead of Jumpin' Jack. We open with Calm Mind, and Golem starts his turns with two bulldozers, to which we respond with Brain Punch, causing Commodo to heal Golem with a full restore. I have Russell use an Agile Moon Blast, to which Golem responds with Iron Head, and we use an Agile Drain Punch to pulverize the rock, also losing our stat boosts on the same turn. 
return, before Kamado sends Snorlax out to get revenge with critting a Giga Impact, taking Russell down. I send Gradinia out and set up with Bulk Up, followed by Drain Punch, which just falls short of the KO, and Gradinia has to endure a Zen Headbutt before finishing Snorlax with an Agile Mock Punch, having Clefable come out and takes Gradinia down with Psychic. I have Radar come out, and we luck out with an Agile Cross Poison, which also crits overcoming Clefable's Resolve. Braviary then comes out for revenge with his own one-shot with Strong Style Esper Wing, and grounds Radar. I then call out Jumpin' Jack to take advantage of the turn order with an Agile and regular Ice Beams, leaving Kamado with Heracross, who sets up with Sword Dance and uses Pin Missile, but the Shards fail to phase Jumpin' Jack, who uses Agile Air Slash, followed by Strong Style Air Slash, overwhelming Heracross, sealing the win with Flash Hoof, only keeping his Pokeball warm. After analyzing my battle style and source of my team's strength, he awards me with a Fist Plate and tells me he found it on the beach when they first arrived here, and thinks passing it on to me seems fitting since I first arrived on this beach as well, and tells me he finally believes in destiny before christening the land as the Sinnoh region, and counts the galaxy team lucky that I joined them, and for saving the day for everyone, before telling me to carry on my survey work for a brighter future. I then conclude the family feud side request for the shopkeeper, and then go catch Mesprit with Jumpin' Jack and Radar. Next up is a trip to the coastlands where I run into Warden Polina and Irida, with Polina being happy to have been seen at the festival with Iskin, and wants to tell us that something is wrong at Firespit Island again, with Irida worrying where this conversation is going since Firespit is a hot place, to which Polina takes the opportunity to tease her about disrespecting one of the Pearl Clan's nobles, before we head off to investigate the disturbance. I pass Polina on the way to a cave entrance where Warden Iskin and Irida are waiting. Iskin welcomes me, and Irida asks them where Polina is, to where he nervously says she's going to spend time with Arcanine, and for us to proceed without her, causing Irida to get annoyed with her. Iskin tries to defend Polina before suggesting we get it over with. Upon entering the volcano, I find Irida and Iskin in awe of Heatran, and she tells me to be careful. But after defeating Heatran, I then succeed to catch it with Jumpin' Jack's help both times, followed by finding the iron plate. Irida then comments about the heat letting up a little, and asks if she even needed to be here. Iskin scrambles to give her a reason to be present for this capture, to which Irida suspects Polina is getting payback for asking her to train Growlithe. Iskin then ends up confessing that she mentioned something about showing tough love, confirming Irida's suspicion before they depart. My next stop is Moonview Arena at Mount Coronet, where Melly rudely asks me if I've heard of Cresselia and is not surprised when I answer yes, while still being salty over my beating him. Warden Kalava then shares the legend of Cresselia's feathers, causing pleasant and dreams, but Melly is upset that Cresselia has invaded the arena, causing Electro to hide, with Warden Kalaba wanting me to catch Cresselia for the feathers, but Melly just wants the flying croissant gone, and as usual turns it to complimenting himself for Cresselia being at the arena. In the arena, I conquer her tricks and catch her with Russell and Archie and acquire the dread plate, but Warden Kalaba is disappointed at my not getting any feathers, and Melly is pleased with my success at catching Cresselia and tries to backhand compliment me before Kalaba has heads home. I eventually end up in her neighborhood to reach Lake Fowler to catch Azalf with Denise and Chance, with my next plate stop being Lake Acuity in the Alabaster Icelands, where I catch Yuxi with Archie and Gradinia. With catching the last Lake Guardian, I'm gifted the Draco plate from thin air, but before going to Snowpoint Temple for the next plate, I take some time to rescue Zeke from an Alpha Glalie, and after a reunion of irony, I finish the Missing Sister side request trilogy. I then head inside Snowpoint Temple and reach a huge locked door to where Adalan and fun-loving Warden Savi show up and ask me what I'm up to, with Savi knowing right away with her clairvoyance. Ottoman then tells me what's behind the door, and Savi says they never could open it. But with the stone, iron, and icicle Reggie's uh, plates, the door opens to reveal more stairs. But at the end of the corridor, Ottoman and Savi are shocked to behold the huge, uh, tall continent Pokemon Reggie Gigas, who after zoot zooting me and fighting my Pokeballs, finally gets caught with the help of Flash Hoop and pick up the blank plate. Ottoman and Savi levitate over and discuss the Pokemon I caught and can't wait to see its Pokedex entry before making their signature goodbyes. I head back to Jubilife, and after showing a Rezu Curlia, I change my hairstyle in inspiration for the upcoming battle with the champion. I then prep the team with candy and finally grit them up with six points for each teammate, before heading to Mistress Kajita, who asks if I got the plates. Bolo confirms I did, and asks if she knows any more, to which she tells us to fetch her three logs as a side request. And since Bolo ironically doesn't have any, he sends me to go get the logs, which is just a trivial chore, right? 
Not this time. I lose a log to falling and get jumped by Clover and wipe most of my team, worrying about overleveling, but I find out I had nothing to worry about and eventually get the rest of the wood. I eventually make my way back to Mistress Kajita's place, and after Volo gets overexcited to the secret of the wood, to which Mistress Kajita tells us it's, wait for it, new cutting boards! To Volo's shock and annoyance, saying we're not searching for dinner plates, prompting Mistress Kajita to lecture Volo before rewarding my hard work with the pixie plate, causing Volo to freak out to what I have in my hand before calming down enough to confirm it's one of the plates we're looking for, causing Mistress Kajita to want to take a closer look at it before telling us what she used it for, and asks what we're going to do now, to which Volo suggests he and I head to the Celestical Ruins to find more secrets, and Mistress Kajita calls him out as just wanting to comb more ruins before bidding us goodbye, with Volo saying he'll see me there. After he leaves, Mistress Kajita shares with me she also is curious to what we'll find. I make the trip to the Coronet Highlands to find Volo by a broken statue that he asked me to have a look at, and after pointing out it's the only statue here, he asked me if I know what Pokemon the statue was an image of. After my answer, he shares with me the legends about Dialga, Palkia, and this Pokemon, which was banished, as well as sharing its name, which is Giratina, before telling me why it was banished and asks where I think we can find it now, and after some hinting, I suggest that the Temple of Sinnoh. Volo then starts to act strange, blaming the excitement getting to him, loosening his lips, before sharing with me why he has an obsession with Hisui's myths and legends is to seek out Arceus to forge a better world, and wants us to head to the Temple of Sinnoh on Mount Coronet's Peak to see if the plates will react to where the rift was and to see if Giratina is there. Volo goes on ahead and I soon catch up, empty my pockets, and save before talking to him, to where he says the place now looks like spears piercing the heavens and doesn't detect Giratina. After I look at him strangely, he then reveals he's tried to learn everything he can as to how to meet Arceus, and even tells me he had Giratina create the space-time rift, but after that failed, he had me search for the place of Arceus as the legends directed, and with my having 17, he reveals he was given the last plate by Giratina, before doing an evil Superman reveal, ordering me to give him the plates, and because of his desire to obtain Arceus and reset the world to his designs, he is willing to fight for them, and so starts the first attempt against the first champion of Sinnoh. Volo the Insane. Oh, I've been waiting for this, Volo. I've been waiting. And now that it's here, let's go! Volo opens with Spiritum, and I go with Russell. Go, Russell! I choose you! And have him use Agile Moonblast, causing Volo to switch out for Roseray to use Spikes, to which we respond with Strong Style Psychic, falling short of the KO, forcing Volo to use his Full Restore, and I have Russell set up with an Agile Calm Mind, but Spikes causes too much chip damage, and he falls to Roseray's Poison Jab. I send out Jumpin' Jack next to use Ice Beam, which also gets the Frostbite, before dodging Petal Dance to finish Roseray off with a stat boosting Agile Silver Wind. He calls out Lucario next and has him use Bullet Punch, followed by close combat. Since Jumpin' Jack has ineffective moves against Lucario, I swap him for Gradenia and Lucario goes for bulk up with Gradenia playing copycat. But Lucario reacts with close combat and we get an easy takedown with Drain Punch. He then goes with Togekiss and sets up Calm Mind to survive a Poison Jab, getting Payback with Moonblast felling Gradenia, causing Jumpin' Jack to come back in and use Agile Roost followed by Ice Beam to ground Togekiss. Volo then has Spiritomb return, using Agile and Strong Style Dark Pulses to nail Jumpin' Jack. After realizing I can't have three teammates make it to the next phase with full health, I throw with having Archie get bested by Garchomp, followed by Radar and Chance falling to Arcanine. To save time on future attempts, I save it after the defeat, and after changing Gradenia and Archie's movesets, we're ready to start attempt 2. I have Russell start out using Agile Moonblast again, but this time Volo uses his full restore and we set up with Calm Mind before Spiritomb makes Russell drowsy with Hypnosis. But Russell ignores it and lands a one-shot Moonblast, to which Roseray comes in and fails a one-shot Poison Jab, to which Russell fires back with Strong Style Psychic for the sweep. And as I planned, he sends out Garchomp to get revenge with Iron Head, causing Russell to get a well-deserved rest. I then send out Gradenia to set up with bulk up to endure Garchomp's agile and regular Dragon Claw combo before Gradenia drops the dragon with a strong ice punch causing Togekiss to come in for a reversal with an Agile Moonblast, overwhelming Gradenia. I then send out Speedy Archie to use Double Iron Head on Togekiss's dome for a takedown. He then has Lucario attack Archie with Bullet Punch and Close Combat, but Archie hangs in there just enough to clobber Lucario with Earth Power before falling to Volo's last Pokemon using Strong Style Crunch. But Radar comes in for revenge on Arcanine with Dark Pulse and Hypnosis, which overwhelms the Fire Dog, and with our next pair of turns, Radar uses Dark Pulse twice to take the fire dog down, beating the first phase. Boom, that's first phase.
Yes, they all got two level ups. You might have noticed my team using Volo's team as the level cap instead of Giratina. I did this as my way of avoiding making it easier to reach Giratina, but set the team's XP to possibly reach the level cap for Giratina when getting to that phase of the battle by doing a leveling strat called Edging. Let's go, Giratina. Just as it seems Volo's lost, a portal opens and Giratina comes through, to which he tells him to strike me down. We'll see about that. Chansei, I choose you. I figured out how to lead with Chansei in the next phase of the battle, and after transforming, she's hit with Shadow Force. She then misses an Agile Stun Spore before falling to another Shadow Force. I then send out Jumpin' Jack to nerf Giratina with Baby Doll Eyes, followed by Ice Beam before taking Shadow Force. I decide to go for a Heal Stall Strat with Roost, causing Giratina to use Shadow Force, and after checking Giratina's conditions, we use another Roost to take Giratina's final Shadow Force. After Roosting again, Giratina resorts to Earth Power, to which I then have Jumpin' Jumpin' Jack used Baby Doll Eyes to wait out Giratina's Obscurity, to which it used Aura Spear this time. We then use another Roost, and Giratina goes for another Aura Spear, to which we respond with an Agile Ice Beam. Giratina then uses Earth Power, and I decide to have Jumpin' Jack deal with Roost, but Giratina throws his first Curveball with an Agile Earth Power and a Dragon Claw, restoring its attack power. But since I can't double Ice Beam, I go with Agile Baby Doll Eyes and Roost, but Giratina already broke the cycle and crits Agile Aura Spear, followed by landing a defense dropping earth power. We desperately try to hang on with Roost and endure another earth power before roosting again, but Giratina sees through my plan and restores its stats with an agile earth power before smiting Jumpin' Jack with a strong earth power, making the whole strat accomplish nothing compared to a slug it out strat. I'm down to just Radar, who's ready for revenge by slapping Giratina with Dark Pulse and Bite before eating an Aura Spear to chew on Giratina with an agile bite. Unlocking third phase Giratina's origin form and nearly faints to Giratina's Shadow Force, but is too dizzy to land two attempts at Hypnosis, while also dodging Giratina's next Shadow Force. But he then misses another Hypnosis before being claimed by Shadow Force. And we lose the battle, but I learn my lessons from my mistakes, and I'm ready to challenge Volo again. I lead with Russell again, and land a stat-dropping Agile Moonblast, causing Volo to restore Spiritomb's health, to which we set up Calm Mind, eating a weak Shadow Ball, before using another Agile Moonblast to banish the Ghost back to their rock. On cue, he tosses out Rose Raid for massive damage with Poison Jab, before falling to a strong Psychic Attack. Garchomp then comes out, getting payback with Iron Head. I then decide to switch gears with Archie coming in, to show he's the better Garchomp with a one-shot strong style Dragon Claw which also crits. Togekiss is sent in and sets up Calm Mind before moon blasting Archie to the ground. To face this problem I send Jumpin' Jack into the fray and learning from Giratina go with Ice Beam which gets a Frostbite nerfing Togekiss's Moon Blast which lowers our attack power in return. But I have Jumpin' Jack test our damage output with Agile Ice Beam before Agile Roosting. Togekiss then tries to imitate Giratina's strategy with an Agile Moon Blast but it backfires and the regular Moon Blast barely tickles before shaking off frostbite. We then use baby doll eyes to set up a healing strat with roost and easily take a moon blast before using agile roost to get hit harder with the next moon blast. And after being safe from double attack, Jumpin' Jack heals with roost again and after taking the next moon blast more easily, we make our move and finish Togekiss with an agile ice beam, prompting Volo's Lucario to use close combat for an obvious takedown. I send out Gradenia to set up with bulk up and Lucario tries to resist with close combat but is pummeled by drain punch, causing Arcanine to be sent in to try with Raging Fury, but meets the same fate to a strong style drain punch, locking in our team against Giratina. I lead off with Chansei again and get a repeat of the last attempt with getting hit by Shadow Force, and this time missing a strong style stun spore before falling to another Shadow Force. I then send out Gradenia to set up bulk up before getting hit with Shadow Force. Gradenia then, against all odds, hits Agile Ice Punch and Regular Ice Punch getting the Frostbite, and barely survives another Shadow Force before trying for another Ice Punch. That hits, causing Phase 3 to activate, and like a true MVP, Gradenia dodges the first Shadow Force to land one more Ice Punch before going down to Shadow Force for a well-earned rest. Finally, Radar comes in to use Dark Pulse before eating a Shadow Force to seal our victory with Agile and Strong Style Dark Pulse. Let's go, baby! Let's go! I am the winner! Woo! Let's go, Pokemon! Legends Arceus, second playthrough, victory! And with that, the run is complete.
After that defeat, Bolo criticizes Giratina for running away after the beating it took before asking me if I was driven by a dream, which I have to say yes, Bolo. It was a dream to beat you with a special rule set. Bolo then tells me he hasn't given up on his dream to one day obtain Arceus no matter how long it takes, and tells me he won't sit on the sidelines while I meet Arceus before leaving a broken man never to be seen again. And that concludes the run, but before closing the video, I want to thank you all for watching my second run of Underdog Challenge, and for anyone who's curious, here's a picture of my first team when I conquered this challenge for the first time, which took me nearly a whole day to get the circumstances right, but I've learned a thing or two since then, and this time it only took me three tries to beat Polo. I may try the hardcore version of this, I may try the hardcore version of this run in the future, but if I do, I guarantee it'll be a much shorter video with a lot less narration, as well as skipping over some of the story bits to try and condense it down even further. But whether I ever get around to making that or not, I hope you enjoyed this video and wish you all a good rest of your time awake.